Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host, as always, Daniel Levy. And today we're going to talk about UFC Vegas 92. Edson Barbosa versus Lerone Murphy and my friends. It's going down this Saturday night live at the Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada. You got the absolute legend, Edson Barbosa, doing, doing a little bit of gatekeeping. You know, we got to test out the young British prospect, Lerone Murphy, who's undefeated. And we got to see if he's ready for the top 15 and eventually the top 10 or not. So that's exactly what this fight is about. So without further ado. Let's get down, let's get down to business. Give you one more night, one more night to get this. We've had a million, million nights just like this. So let's get down, let's get down to business. Main event of the evening in the featherweight division. We got the legend, Edson Barboza. He's 24 and 11, taking on the undefeated Leron Murphy, who's 13 0 and 1. And currently, they got it. Leron Murphy minus 150. The comeback on Edson Barbosa is plus 130. So shout out to the legend Edson Barbosa. I mean, we're talking about a guy who's won fights via leg kicks, body kicks, head kicks, punches, spin kicks, knees. I think the only thing he might be missing is an elbow knockout. Does Barbosa have any elbow knockouts? I think that might be the one missing. He's got body shots. He's got it all. So, I mean, what can I say? You know, when you talk about First class entertainment, you talk about Edson Barboza. When you talk about some of the most brutal knockouts in the history of the sport, you talk about Edson Barboza. But th this kid, Leron Murphy, is good, man. You know, he kind of represents, you know, kind of similar to that Leon Edwards style, you know, the southpaw kind of lower volume, but super technical and is able to kind of slow fights down and turn it into like a technique fest, you know, lots of fainting. Lots of waiting, but when he goes, he makes a count and he gets better as fights progress. And he hasn't had an easy run up until now. Obviously, this is a huge step up in competition, but when you look at the guys he's fought, you know, notable names, Zubera Tukugov, notable names in terms of like, if you're a hardcore fan, you know exactly who the guys he fought. Is. If you're casual, you probably don't, but you know, he smashed Ricardo Ramos, had a good fight against Douglas Silva D'Andrage. Makwan Amirkani handled him exactly how you're supposed to. You just get, pa get past the first round and you win. Uh, the Gabriel Santos fight was a little controversial, but that was a hell of a fight. Um, that was also the most significant strikes that Lee Rowan's landed in any UFC fight. And even if you didn't score for him, you can at least concede that it was a great fight. And had there been two more rounds, it seemed like the fight was trending in Lee Ron Murphy's direction. So I don't really have too many questions regarding you know, oh, what happens if he goes five? How's his cardio? This and that. And then the fight against Josh Kulabau, I thought was pretty textbook clear 30 27, if not 30 26. So, this is the right step up in competition for a kid like Leroy Murphy. Like, you crush the grapes. Is it time to drink the wine? That's the big question because he's 5 0 and 1 in the UFC, and there's nowhere else to go but to face a legend in the main event. And Barboza is going to let us know exactly where Leroy Murphy's at. That's the beauty of this fight because. With Barboza, you look at his current run, and man, that Billy Q fight, obviously, you know, knocked him out with a knee real quick, but the Sodik fight showed a lot from Barboza. That first round, Sodik looked like the best fighter on planet Earth, and the fact that Edson weathered a storm like that, hey, dog, like, what, what a legend, just the heart that he still has, and the fact that he was able to take over those next four rounds was crazy, shows the kind of desire this man still has to one day fight for a title or even a BMF belt. You know, I saw him calling out Max Holloway recently. Um, who wouldn't want to see a fight like that? But first things first, we got Saturday night. And, you know, there have been questions about Barboza's chin, whether it was back in the day against Varner, whether it was the Cerrone fight getting dropped with a jab or whatnot. But it's just the thing where when you're such a seasoned kickboxer like Barboza and you've been in as many stand and bang wars as he has, I mean, I don't expect his chin rating to be on a hundred. Let's just let's just keep it a hundred on that. You know, let's just let's just keep it a buck as always. I expect like he's got that kickboxing chin. So it, it is what it is. And also, if you take down a guy like Barboza, he tends not to get back up. That's an issue I've kind of had throughout his career. That's why I bet Bryce Mitchell minus 150 there. And then regarding Murphy, does he go for takedowns? Well, his last fight against Josh Kulabau, he landed three takedowns. And besides that, he's only landed, you know, one takedown here and there in some of his fights. And he's actually been taken down of his fair share. But he's pretty decent at getting back up. He's also decent at limiting damage when he is taken down. So the thing I gather is if they just, you know, kickbox for five rounds, 
So on paper, the pace of Barboza is a lot higher. The issue is that when you push a pace against one of these, you know, southpaw low output strikers like a Leon Edwards or like a like a Leon Murphy in this case, you got to be very technically sound because their counters are so on point, whether it's that straight left, whether it's that left high kick, body kicks, whatever the case may be. So Barboza is going to have to be super technically sound if he wants to push a pace. Now, if it becomes a low output kickboxing match, that's exactly what Leron Murphy wants. So, and then there's the big question of, is Leron Murphy going to mix in takedowns? Because like I said, when you do take down Barboza, he tends not to get back up. And then there's the big talking point of all these like old school fighters have just been on a fucking roll lately. Carlos Diego Ferreira last week, Anthony Smith the week prior, Chris Weidman and OSP earlier in the year. And I know there's a couple other examples that, you know, aren't coming to the top of my head that, that happened as well. It's been a crazy year. Maybe it was just a matchup thing, but once you get past like five or six examples, at some point you got to be like, oh, Jose Aldo recently too. It's like, you know, is Barboza going to kind of put one up for the legends one, one more time? Um, that's the big question. But, you know, I'm leaning a little bit towards Murphy, man. Uh, you know, you could say the youth and whatnot, but it's, it's more importantly than that. It was kind of a red flag what happened to Sodiq in that fight. Like I said, Sodiq looked like the best fighter on planet Earth in that first round. And, you know, I had James Vick on for the UFC 300 show to talk about the Sodiq versus Diego fight. And he said, you know, Sodiq was dealing with a lot of injuries and just he couldn't throw. He couldn't do anything after that first round. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not true. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not calling Vick a liar or anything like that. I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, you know, Sodiq was the guy in there. Only he truly knows what happened. Um, the rest of us can speculate, no matter how close we are to the situation. But I, I do think that Barboza is kind of on his way out. And this is a good spot for Murphy to come in here and possibly get a knockout or get a cruise some top control, you know, maybe get a fight of the night. I, I really don't know how this fight's going to go down, but my gut tells me that Murphy gets the biggest one of his career, enters, you know, the upper echelon of the rankings, and we got a new contender on our hands. So, you know, all respect to the legend Barboza. I expect this fight to be competitive at times. I expect it to be exciting. I expect them to to throw some some heat at each other. But ultimately, I see Murphy coming out on top, especially if you can slow this fight down, turn it into one of those low British, you know, low output kickboxing matches and mix in the occasional takedown or two, hold them down, kind of gas them out a little bit, then start to pick your shots further down the stretch. I'm going to go Leroy Murphy here. Now, Cole main event of the evening in the welterweight division. We got Chaos Williams. He's 14 and 3, taking on Carlson Harris, who's 19 and 5. Currently, they got it. Chaos Williams minus 125. The comeback on Carlson Harris is plus 105. This is a hell of a fight. I'm a big fan of both guys. You know, Chaos Williams, he's got that just ridiculous raw power, man. I mean, the way he puts guys out is nasty. He's a little bit stiff with with it with you know his striking, but the power is undeniable. I think his Takedown defense is underrated. You know, apparently this guy did start off in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is important here because think about this dude, Carlson Harris, man. He's like super long and like funky and gives you these weird looks. And like you shoot a sloppy takedown on a guy like Carlson Harris and with those long limbs, he can wrap up that anaconda and that Darce from angles that you're normally safe with other people. You're not going to be safe with Carlson Harris and also with those long limbs. I mean, he can put you at the end of that jab. You know, you think that you're in striking range with him and he's in striking range with you. You're not with him, you know, so you have to be very careful with a guy like Carlson Harris. But I think there's a big durability upside here with Chaos Williams. And I think that there's a good chance that he can actually knock out a guy like Carlson Harris. You just have to be super careful. Like K Harris, like I said, opportunistic, dangerous, long, sneaky. So you just have to be on top of your game with a guy like that. He's super seasoned as well. Like, all respect to Carlston. People keep bringing up the fight with Jared and Carlston. Like, it's annoying how, like, Jared took that fight on Wednesday of fight week and people hold it against him. You know, it's like when, when Jared took it on Wednesday of fight week, everyone was like, oh, Jared's the man for taking that fight. You know, rah, rah, rah. And then the fight happens and he gasses out after round one, which is uncharacteristic of Jared. Jared's known for going three hard. And, um, you know, now everyone's like, oh, Jared's a bum and this and that. It's like, dude, he took the fight on fucking Wednesday of fight week, dude. And even with that said, Carlson Harris couldn't get off on his long man chokes, which he he tried deep into that fight. So I think that if Chaos can just avoid these precarious spots on the mat and, you know, is on top of stuff standing, 
I mean, I think there's a good chance he knocks him out. But, you know, all respect to Carlston. I am a fan of his. I even did a Technique of the Week video on his uh, Anaconda of uh, Jeremiah Wells. So, all respect. I'm going to go chaos. Featured bout also in the welterweight division. We got Ramiz Brachimai. He's 10-4, and four, taking on Themba Garimbo, who's 12-4. and four. Currently, they got it. Themba, minus 145. The comeback on Ramiz is plus 125. I like Ramiz as a person. You know, during the pandemic, I think I played uh, Call of Duty with him once. And I think we're like Facebook friends. You know, he's a really nice guy. I mean, I don't know him on a personal level, but the interaction we did have just seemed really solid. So, you know, I like the guy. And he's very dangerous early on. His style, very grappling heavy, requires a lot of energy. And if you're not up to par with a guy like Ramiz, I mean, he's going to go ahead and take you down and either submit you or pound you out. And he's very nasty, especially early on. But that style requires so much energy. And if he can't get you out of there in that first round, it's not that the guy's not in shape. The guy's in great shape. Look at look at his physique. It's more so that style just requires a stupid amount of energy. And um, Themba, one thing about Themba, you know, he kind of came into the UFC, and I kind of thought, like, for the African fighters, he might kind of be like the, the runt of the litter. I know that sounds very disrespectful, but I, what I meant by that was that I wasn't as impressed with him as I was with the other African fighters. But the fact of the matter is this guy moved to Florida and he's dedicated his life to this and he has made improvements. I mean, you compare the guy who fought in his debut against AJ Fletcher to the last two fights against Takashi and, and Pete. And I know those are soft opponents, of course, but it seems like he's trending in the right direction. It seems like this guy's taking things seriously. He's putting in the work. And I know that uh, endorsement by The Rock doesn't hurt in terms of like, they're giving him softball matchups left and right. And, and I know he had an opponent pull out. And then they, who was the guy they, they set him up with that pulled out? Let me pull that up really quick because that was an easy opponent too. Oh, Kiefer Crosby. You know what I'm saying? Like they're giving him YouTube boxers. They're giving him the Pete Rodriguez's, the Takashi Sato's. And Ramiz is a really tough guy. Um, and I think that this first round, Ramiz might win. But if Themba can get past the first round, that's when I start. That's when I think that Ramiz is going to start to shoot from kind of a mile out. Then Themba starts to sprawl, but then Themba starts to pick him apart and either get a late finish or a 29-28 unanimous decision. So I'm going to go with Themba here. Now, next up in the Bantamweight division, we got a matchup between Adrian Yanez. He's 16-5, and five, taking on Vinicius Salvador, who's 14-6. and six. Currently, they got it. Adrian Yanez, minus 400. The comeback on Vinicius Salvador is plus 330. I'm curious if this fight is you know, as big of a mismatch as the odds indicate because one thing about Vinicius salvador so he's moving up from flyweight where i thought he was a pretty damn big flyweight the guy obviously cut a shit ton of weight to make you know 125 and i'm moving up to 35 a little bit more water in his body and brain and already a big boy five nine five ten i know he's listed at five seven that he ain't no five seven let me tell you that right now this dude's like five nine five ten I think he's gonna look better at 35s he's kind of got my issue with salvador it's not about like oh he's bad at this or, or whatever like oh he's got a weak chin no it's not like that it's like salvador is one of these guys that is a little bit cocky you know kind of fights with his hands down and always automatically assumes that he's ahead on the cards you know so that can be frustrating you can be screaming at your tv like venetius throw and then with Adrian Yanez, you guys know exactly what he brings to the table good boxing for mma but the thing about him is those last two setbacks he had Although, you know, two ranked fighters, you know, no shame in losing to those guys. It's how he lost to those guys. Where's his confidence at? Because this kid really thought that he was just going to go in there, steamroll Rob Font, get right to a title shot. And when he got knocked out in that fashion, and then the way that Jonathan Martinez broke him down, like there's a reason they're giving him an unranked opponent that it, this seems like a get right fight for Adrian. And I understand that on paper because, you know, Adrian Yanez versus a guy that's 0-2 in the UFC. Like, there's probably a home run for Adrian, right? But... <laughs> Man, I'm just I just got questions to, to lay minus 400 when I got questions about where's this kid's mindset at? Like when you hear him talk, he was like during the the Martinez fight, all I was thinking about was the Rob Font fight. It's like that Dominic Reyes syndrome where like Dominic Reyes after the John Jones fight, he's fighting Jan Blachowicz. All he talks about is John Jones. He's fighting Erie. All he talks about is John Jones. He talks about he's fighting Ryan Spann. All he talks about is John Jones. And he gets knocked out in all those fights. And here Adrian Yana is talking about, oh, you know. You know the same kind of shit, but regarding rob font except in dominic reyes case it was he thought he beat john jones in adrian's cases he thought he should have beat rob font and he's still fixated on that but the fighters that have the best success are the ones that put those losses in the past you know you have to have a short-term memory in this game you can't you know you can't be fixated on what happened last year in miami bro you have to be focused on what's ahead of you so 
Yeah, I mean, I got questions about where Adrian's mindset is at because this kid Salvador, he's hungry. He's coming to win. This is not some pushover. Like if Adrian treats this guy like like the line indicates, hey, dog, you're back on track. But why do I feel like Vinicius is going to give this guy a fight? Like I really do. I mean, I guess, okay, pure pick, sure. Go Giannis. Why not? He's minus 400 for a reason. But like if I were to bet this fight, it would be Vinicius or pass. Like, I really don't think he's that bad. So I'm very curious to see how this fight plays out. If Adrian just embarrasses him, good for you, kid. But, uh, man, I, I think I think there's a chance. I don't know if it's going to be an upset or at least the fight is closer than the line indicates. So let, let, I'm going to be paying attention to that one. Next up in the strawweight division, we've got a matchup between Angela Hill. She's 16 and 13, taking on Luana Pinheiro, who's 11 and 2. Currently, they got it. Angela Hill at minus 140 to come back on Luana's plus 120. So you guys know, historically, I usually pick against Angela Hill. Um, I mean, with a record like that, how could you not? And also, like, she'll, like, lose these fights that she clearly lost and then act like she won, like the Yan Zhaonan fight. And I just hate that shit, dude. But the thing about Pinheiro, and I mean this respectfully, well, there's really not a respectful way to say this, but I think Pinheiro might kind of be, like, a little bit fraudulent, man, like that fight against random marcos dude like come on man like you guys know i hate that shit dude that aljamain sterling acting job stuff like there's no room for that in this sport man and it's funny because like if you bet on uh the person that that you know pulled the acting job for the dq you're happy hey i got paid but like just as a fan who likes violence who likes real fighters like i just i can't do it but to give her credit she is athletic she is decent on the mat and technically speaking, she's not bad. The, the questions with Luana Pinero is when it actually becomes a real fight. When when you when you stand up to this girl, you know, she got that bully mentality. When you stand up to this girl, she does not like it. And that first round's probably gonna be a little rough. But if Angela Hill, you know, I know she's getting up there in age, but if she still has something left, I think she can definitely win the second and third round and probably get a 29, 28 decision. So I don't like betting on Angela Hill, let alone at chalk. It's probably dog or pass, but pure pick, I'm gonna go Angela. Next up in the lightweight division, we've got a matchup between Tom Nolan. He's six and one. Taking on Victor Martinez, who's 13 and five. Currently, they got it. Tom Nolan, minus 475. The comeback on Victor Martinez is plus 375. So it's like people didn't learn their lesson. Last time Tom Nolan was a price like this, and he got destroyed. And same thing with uh with Victor. You know, I thought that similar to Tom Nolan. Both their UFC debuts, they got sparked in the first round, but I don't think either guy's as bad as they showed to be. In that debut like you go back to victor's contender series fight and didn't he like set an output record um in that fight i'm pretty sure yeah he landed 144 significant um through you know over 270 strikes like that's pretty impressive so this goes three rounds you know you never know this could be a war but there's some physical attributes that tom nolan has on his side he's six foot three taking on a five eight opponent which i mean that was the case last time when he got knocked out but still Got a three-inch three inch reach advantage. He's a very long guy from down under. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, I think that Tom Nolan's talented. It's just, he's six and one. He's super green. And this kid, Victor Martina, he's not that talented, but he's like a hard worker. He's like a tough Mexican dude that, you know, fights out of four to seven May and is going to be there to, to bang. So, you know, the line indicates that Tom's just going to come out here and spark him in one. And I guess if Jordan Levitt can spark you in one, Tom Nolan probably can too. And, and you know, Tom Nolan's knockout loss was to Nick Mata, who, you know, say what you want about Nick Mata, but Buddy can crack, right? Whereas Jordan Levitt, bad look, but, you know, this uh, this ain't the place to to do MMA math, right? Like, it's probably a dog or pass situation that, you know, it's close to minus 500. But, yeah, pure pick, I'll go Tom Nolan, the physical advantages – Keep him at the end of that jab, eventually find a home for that straight right. But I mean, we just don't know enough about Nolan. He fought bums on his regional scene. He's always six and one. He's super inexperienced. Yeah, it's just, it's tough. But I'll pick him, you know, for his physical advantages. Next up in the 205 pound division, we got a match between Umar C. He's nine and oh, taking on the new, oh, they're both newcomers, taking on Tuco Tokos, who's 10 and three. Currently, they got it. Umar C minus four twenty five. The comeback on, well, on on fight odds, it says his name is George Tokos. But either way, Tokos is plus three twenty five. So Umar C kind of like a physical specimen goes balls to the wall early on and can get a lot of guys out there early. But due to his style, mixed in with his physique, 
Fights get extended. You know, he might be a bit of a gasser. And his opponent, Tukos, man, he leaves a lot of openings, especially early on. Like, he's a dude, he's not like, he doesn't have that tall man's defense. Like, he's not like a tall, skinny guy. Don't get me wrong. He's a tall boy. He's like, what, 6'4? But I'm saying at 205, that's not like a 6'4 lightweight or a 6'4 welterweight. Like, he's, he's just, you know, a normal size 205er. But man, he leaves his chin straight up in the air. He drops his hands a lot. And early on, He's got a lot of defensive liabilities, and that's where I think Umar C can come out here and get an early finish. But if Tukos can survive early and extend this, that's where all bets are off the table and things might get kind of interesting. But I think Umar C, there's a chance he might rat, like just run through this guy. So let's see. I'm going to go Umar C for the win. Next up in the Bantamweight division, we got a matchup between Melissa Gatto. She's 8-2-2, two, and two, taking on Tamira's Vidal, who's 7-2. and two, But between you and me, guys, she's 6-3 and because she 100% lost that Alien Perez fight. Currently, they got it. Melissa Gatto, minus 345. The comeback on Tamira's Vidal is plus 270. So I hear a lot of people making the case for Tamira's Vidal. I'm not one of those people. I'm not impressed with Tamira's Vidal at all. Um, you know, I think that she... I mean, I don't like being the guy that's going to be like, oh, in two fights, she's going to be gone and this and that. But I just don't think she's got the skills to compete at this level and sustain you know, a long-term UFC career, whereas Gato, I've been very impressed with. Like, Let's even talk about her loss to Tracy Cortez. Like, She was scrambling very admirably with someone with the wrestling credentials like Tracy Cortez. Melissa Gato was experienced on a regional scene. She finished Carl Hosa, who's a big girl who's proven in the UFC. And I love the fact that Gato gets violent uh, with her striking, with her submissions. Her wrestling defense isn't the best, but it's gotten better. And her scrambling ability is there. And she's just, she's got that dog in her. And she's infinitely meaner and tougher than Tamir's Vidal. And I know people are trying to make this seem like a dogger pass situation. I don't know, man. I think this might actually be a spot where you can parlay Gato. Now watch her lose a split and I look like a fucking uh, idiot. I was about to say a word I shouldn't say, but... Watch me look like an idiot, but no, I, I got Gato here, man. I think Gato actually wins kind of dominantly. What was interesting to me was that the odds open minus 110 apiece. Uh, obviously, that was probably way off, you know, the market corrected it, but I'm curious why the odds makers thought it should be minus 110 apiece, but I don't think it should be minus 110 apiece. I think the current line is probably about right. I think Melissa Gato, there's a chance for domination here, so I think she's going to finish Tamir's Vidal. And next up in the middleweight division, we got a matchup between Abus Magomedov. He's 25 and 6, taking on Warley Alves, who's 14 and 7. Currently, they got it. Abus minus 250. The comeback on Warley Alves is plus 210. So, you know, automatically when you see Abus at minus 250, you got to think to yourself, like, there's no way in hell I'm laying a price like this on this guy. You know, if his name was Abus Johnson, no one would give a shit. Like, this guy ain't even Russian. His last name is Magomedov, but he's German. So let's, like, Let's calm down. And, you know, he's a one-round fighter. But, you know, Worley Alves has a reputation of being a one-round fighter, too. Even though, I got to say, in that Nick Dalby fight, you know, Nick Nick is on a little career resurgence. And Worley seemed to really pick things up late in that fight. So that was good to see. But here at middleweight, I know that last fight against Ikram didn't go his way. But Ikram seems like a legit prospect. So now, I actually think it's a dogger pass situation. Look, of course, there's a chance that Abus comes out here and just starches Worley early. Of course. Like, we understand that. Um, you know, Abus had a good first round against Sean. He destroyed Dustin Stolzfus, but Abus is very questionable. Like people give him shit for that uh Lewis Taylor knockout loss. I don't. Lewis Taylor is a demon, bro. Like that dude hits stupid hard. Like you should see what Phil Hot, I mean, excuse me, you should see what Lewis Taylor was doing to some of these guys in PFL prior to his Abus fight. Like Lewis Taylor, that's no slouch at all. So there's no shame in losing that fight. It's just the, the Strickland and the Kyle fights, like the way that this man just completely, like all the fight was drained out of him after round one. That's a red flag. And Worley's a very seasoned, experienced UFC fighter. Um, it's just Worley, he's got his issues too, whether it's his gas tank or his chin or his heart. But man, he's so much more seasoned. I really think if Worley doesn't get, you know, flatline early, he, he's going to win this fight. So actually, I'll go with Worley Alves here for the upset. Now, next up in the strawweight division, we got a matchup between Piero Rodriguez. She's nine and one, taking on Ariane Carnalosi, who's fourteen and three. Currently, they got it. Piero Rodriguez minus two twenty. Holy shit! The comeback on Ariane Carnalosi is plus one eighty five. So, yeah, obviously, I'm not interested in laying a price like this. But you know, I think that Piero Rodriguez is the more technical fighter here. Ar Ariane Carnalosi kind of has that like Andrade kind of quality to her, where she's 
super short, stocky, has like dude muscles, hits hard, but she's not very technical at all. She just kind of swings wide. And Piera, you know, training out of Kings MMA, or at least she used to, she can throw those straight punches down the pipe, the kicks, stuff takedowns, and probably win a decision here. So I'm not interested in no minus 220, but I am going to lean with Piera Rodriguez to win this fight here. Now, Next up in the Bantamweight division, we got a matchup between Alatong Hey Lee, 16 and 9, taking on Clay Jason Rodriguez, who's 8 and 3. Currently, they got it. Clay Jason Rodriguez, minus 150. The comeback on Alatang Hey Lee is plus 130. This is an interesting fight because Clay Jason, I think that he's better than he showed, but I do have to say that contender series opponent he fought was an ultra soft opponent. And then the kid seemed like he was cutting too much weight at flyaway. You know, he missed weight a couple times. I thought that fight with CJ Vergara, uh, Vergara was a good fight. Um, and then the Farid fight, Farid Bashra fight, I don't hold that against him. There was a massive size and skill discrepancy between those two. And I think I even laid a big price on Farid straight there. The here with Alatang Ali, I just consider Alatang Ali to just kind of be just solid average everywhere. Like nothing special in any department, but just solid in every department. You know, average athlete, average striker, average wrestler, average grappler, just average. Um, you know, Casey Kenny was really lighting his ass up with those body kicks. I think that Clay Jason can have similar success here, but it's just, you don't want to have Clay Jason have one of these moments where he just, you know, pulls a stunt on you. He's a young kid. Um, there's questions about his heart. There's questions about how good he actually is, but here against like kind of an average opponent, he should he should be able to get this one. But it, it, it's tough because, again, like Alatang Haile is proven to just kind of be, in my opinion, just an average journeyman. He'll stick around, sure, win some, lose some, no big deal. Never hit the rankings. Um, will never be anything special. But if you're not quite ready for his level, you know he will go out there and beat you. But Clay Jason, you know, when he first got on Contender Series, I was like, okay, this kid could be good, but that Contender Series opponent was terrible, and then there was some issues with the scale, so he needs to kind of find his footing. He needs to kind of feel like the UFC is his home. He start, needs to kind of feel comfortable. This is a good opportunity for him to do so. Like I said, you're not going to be surprised by anything Alatang Haile does. There's nothing crazy to worry about. It's just a solid, average, well-rounded guy, and if Clay Jason can deal with that, he should be able to win this fight, so I'll, I'll go Clay Jason here. Now, last but not least in the strawweight division, we've got a matchup between Emily Ducote. She's 13 and 8, taking on Vanessa Demopoulos, who's 10 and 5. Currently, they got it. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Emily Ducote, minus 375. The comeback on Vanessa Demopoulos is plus 310. So, again, it's like similar to the Piera fight. It's like, okay, yeah, sure, I favor Emily Ducote. I think that she's a lot more technically sound um, than Vanessa. And I do like some of the numbers that Emily's put up, you know, in three out of four of her UFC fights, she's landed over hundred significant strikes. So that's obviously a very good look, but Vanessa has this quality about her. where, like, look, her striking isn't the prettiest and just her whole fighting style is not the prettiest, but like, she's mean, she's tough. She gets in there and she tries, she goes for it. That's why she's been able to kind of get some of these decisions that people think she may have actually lost is because she has a lot of effort. And, and she shows that she wants it and opportunistic arm bars off her back. And yeah, so I, I like Vanessa. She's, you know, seems like a solid chick and I like her effort and her heart and her desire. But Emily Ducote is the far more technically superior fighter here. It's just I ain't in the business of laying no minus 375 on Emily Ducote. So yeah, it's Ducote the pick. But again, at these odds, probably dogger pass. So Wow, we did this card very, very quickly, my friends. Um, let's talk about the fight to watch on the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC Vegas 92? The fight to watch is 100% Adrian Yanez versus Vinicius Salvador. I mean, their UFC is literally telling Adrian Yanez, like, here you go, man. Here's an 0-2 opponent. Let's get your feet back under you. Let's get comfortable again, and let's get back in the win column. But Vinicius Salvador, 0-2 in the UFC, and both those fights were pretty damn close. Moving up to Bantamweight, he's going to be – He's not going to be a small bantamweight at all. I'll tell you that right now. And I know for a fact, like, he's got upset all over his mind. And uh, for that reason, Yanez or Salvador is my fight to watch. My fighter to watch is Melissa Gatto. I know she's coming off two straight losses, but against decent competition. And now she's got such a step down into Mirrors Vidal where she can go out here, make a statement. I think she can get a finish. 
and remind people like why she was this prospect when she first came into the UFC and let's get her back in these exciting matchups. Like I think that you put uh, Melissa Gatto in there with like a Jasmine Jazz Devicious. That's an exciting fight. Like there's a lot of good fights you can do with her. So then she gets Tamira's Vidal out the way and then we got some exciting matchups to look up to uh, look up to look forward to in the future is what I mean to say. So yeah, Melissa Gatto is my fighter to watch. My friends, we did it. Thank you so much for checking out the special UFC Vegas 92 edition of Half the Battle. Make sure y'all check out that interview I did with the heavy metal band Doth. It's on my page. Um, like I told y'all, I'm trying to interview people from all walks of life. They got a new album out called The Deceivers, which is so fucking badass. So the fact that I got to talk to them was super cool. Let me know what y'all think about that interview. And uh, leave me a like, a comment. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. When this is over, if you feel so inclined to share, I appreciate that as well. And reach out to me on Twitter at Best Fight Picks, on Instagram at Half the Battle Pod. And until the next time, let's cash these bets.